This is a very beautiful presentation case. It's not the original box for this particular gun, but it is a presentation case made especially for this gun by Smith & Wesson. If you're a fan of the 44 Magnum, then you probably already know the history of the cartridge, at least in one popular version or another. Most people credit Elmer Keith with the creation of the round, but that's not entirely accurate. It was more a collaboration than a one-man invention, but to be sure, Elmer Keith played a key role. And in case you don't know, Elmer Keith was the creator of the 357 Magnum cartridge as well. So the idea that Keith had for the 44 Magnum was to take the 44 Special Load and increase it dramatically so that it would be capable of stopping any large angry predator, whether it roamed on four feet or two. Smith & Wesson was run at that time by a gentleman named Carl Hallstrom, who loved the idea and had his company develop a gun and some prototype ammunition. This all took place in the early 1950s, and the development process was rather quick. It must have been an amazing time to be in the industry, as you can imagine the team working up a new load and then literally stepping out back to test it. The 44 Magnum was officially born in 1954. Immediately thereafter, Smith & Wesson started working on building the gun for this new powerhouse. And that brings us to this treasured handgun that I have here. It's reported that the very first revolver was built at the end of December 1955. It was used to further develop the ammunition for commercial use. That was done by Remington, hence the name of the cartridge that remains today, 44 Remington Magnum. Production of the guns for commercial and law enforcement sale started in 1956. The beautiful piece you see here was made in that year, 1956. I'm an oldster, but this gun is older than I am. Back then, Smith did not yet call their guns by model numbers. They just had various names. This was simply known as the 44 Magnum. It's always been an end frame, and while it has been offered in many barrel lengths over the years, it's always been most recognized in the 6.5 inch barrel that you see here. So this is in fact not a Model 29, for there was no such thing when this gun was made. And this is what's known as a pre-29. Now, if all that weren't enough to make me seriously consider whether or not I should shoot it, it is the considered opinion of many people, myself, my trusted gunsmith and pistol maker, my very knowledgeable dealer, Masayub, and even Hickok 45, that on close examination, this gun appears to have never been fired, except for likely at the factory before shipment. To think that for longer than I've been alive, this gun has been sitting in a box, unfired, waiting. Aside for the slightest hint of wear that's undoubtedly from physical admiration of it over the years, it's in absolutely perfect condition. The only marks to the finish are from continued rubbing to keep the finish clean. Ironic, eh? The chambers are pristine and look as though no cylinder of brass has ever violated them. There's not a speck of carbon residue around the forcing cone. The celebrity experts were a bit divided in their advice, however. Hickok 45 says that I should not shoot this beautiful gun. He says I should send it to him and let him shoot it. Masayub, on the other hand, after turning it over and over in his hands, feeling the glassy smoothness of its action, said, well, it's got a turn line on the cylinder. Might as well shoot it. And so I think I've decided to do just that. I believe, ultimately, that guns are for shooting and enjoying. And this one's made its way to me, and I am bestowed with that honor. I won't shoot full power loads through it, though. I have no desire to wear the parts or weaken the timing, even the fraction of a little bit. 
I will most likely shoot some, maybe some of my hand loads, which are a 44 Magnum light, <laughs> running a 240 grain bullet at about a thousand feet per second, and I might shoot some 44 specials for fun, and then we'll put it away. This gun really is just something to admire, though. The finish on it is incredible. It is so deep and so black, you just feel like you could reach your arm down into it. And as I said, it's been very well cared for. It just has some very light marks in the finish, basically like polishing scratches. You know, sort of like overwaxing your black car. The grips that you see on this gun are also the original grips to this gun. They themselves bring a high price on the market when you can find them. They're called Coke bottle grips, and they are amazingly comfortable to shoot. And then last but absolutely not least is that glass smooth action. The action on this gun is just incredible. It literally is something you have to feel to, to understand. I wish I could pass it around and let you all feel it, but it is incredible. Of course, it has this very large and very well knurled hammer spur, and that is called their target hammer. Very big and very square. I like that squareness. Firing pin is, of course, integral to the hammer. It is pinned in to the hammer. That's how they used to make them. And, of course, you can see there is no lock right up there above the cylinder release. The barrel is pinned, as barrels were back in those days. It has those counterboard chambers in the cylinder. There's the pinned barrel, there's the pin there, and again this action just feels so buttery smooth. Mm. Incredible. And yes, as Mass Ayub identified, there is certainly a pronounced turn ring on it, and I'm guilty of making it even deeper because I love to do this <laughs> feel that action it is incredible so there she is and you can see on this side of the barrel it says simply Smith and Wesson and on this side 44 Magnum doesn't say model 29 anywhere because there was no such thing and even in, down in here you can see that there is no place with any designation model 29 One of the other things I noticed too, and actually my gunsmith kind of pointed it out, is look how tight that cylinder is to the forcing cone. So much so that, let me find a spot here, so much so that there are even some abrasions on the face of the cylinder where it rubbed against that forcing cone. It is so tight. Absolutely incredible. Adjustable rear sight, of course, with the white outline and the fixed front sight with the orange insert. Yep, even back in 1956, they were doing that. Just an absolute exquisite piece of art. Absolutely amazing. Cook bottle grips, I talked about them once before, but... They got their name by their shape, because if you look at the back, you can see that curvature, and it was like a Coke bottle. Old-time Coke bottle had that same type of curvature, and that's where they got their name. But they are very comfortable, very comfortable to hold because of that swell in the middle. And they are also, those wooden stocks are also in perfect, beautiful condition. All right, guys, here goes nothing. Very first shots through this beautiful 1956 Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum pre-Model 29. Nice sight picture. This trigger just feels so good.
These grips are awesome. No wonder they're so valuable. I am all over that target though. Hope I don't shoot my camera. Wow. Let's see if I can figure out what that's all about. Alright, I'm going to put six of something I know is accurate and reliable. Six hour, elite performance, V-crown. But this is 44 Special, not 44 Magnum. It is 200 grain jacketed hollow point. Really, really good stuff. This ought to make some pretty holes. I'm going to continue to just go single action. Oh man, this thing, it just feels so nice in the hand. These Coke bottle grips are fantastic. No wonder they bring such a high price. Okay, that was a respectable offhand group. Now I'm going to go back to my hand loads and see if I can't make them look halfway decent. Boy, that first group was just everywhere. I wouldn't even call it a group. It was like a scatter pattern. But anyway, I think we know for sure it's not the gun. Back to my hand loads. And again, these are, uh, these are 240 grain bullets and I have them going at about a thousand feet per second. Okay. Okay, not too bad. One odd flyer, and it almost looks like it's tumbling, like it's keyholed. And now I no longer have to wonder whether or not it's ever been fired. I know it's been fired, and I know who fired it. So you remember I told you about the, uh, how tight the cylinder t was to the forcing cone, so much so that there were some abrasions on the cylinder face. I actually had it hang up a couple of times when uh, trying to advance the cylinder. So it's that tight. All it took was a little tiny bit of a nudge with my thumb to get it moving, but uh, it actually did want to hang up a couple times. 
I'd rather have that, I guess, than too loose because that'll either wear in or you could, uh, you could just touch it probably with a stone take care of that. There she is, folks. Born 1956. First fired, presumably, 2019. So I know the year 1956 is like so long ago that for a lot of you, you have no point of reference whatsoever. Might as well say 1856, right? But let me put that in perspective maybe with some well-known references. The movie, The Ten Commandments, in which Charlton Heston plays Moses, the movie that plays year after year on TV, and even if you've never watched it, you've got to at least be familiar with it. Well, that movie debuted in 1956. Elvis Presley had his very first hit record in 1956. It was Heartbreak Hotel. It is also the year that Elvis first appeared on TV, on The Ed Sullivan Show. The Slinky Dog Toy, <laughs> the one that's been probably made more famous by the movie Toy Story than anything, um, that toy was introduced in 1956 and it sold for under $2. There were not yet any interstate highways in the United States. Think about that one for a minute. No interstate highways. My parents had not yet met. Dwight Eisenhower was president, and that is the year that this gun was made. 